Yes, and may I introduce the project to you, the documentary we're of doing, course. so you got a yeah. better idea maybe. Okay. It's about globalization, okay. and we do it for Arte and ZDF, okay. which uh, is a 90-minute documentary for Arte, okay. and um, okay. uh, it's uh, 45 or 60 minutes for ZDF, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you probably know the mm -hmm. station. And yeah, also I for Arte before. I see, yeah. Yeah, you have had a very nice uh, yes. uh, documentary. Uh -huh. We appreciate it very much. Mm -hmm. Really good. And from French, it was a French team, as I got it right. Yeah, or I think so. It, yes. it came from the French side. I see. But it was also translated, I think, and broadcasted in yeah. Germany. Yeah, yeah, with all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also for Curiosity Channel, which is a a uh, science channel on demand in the US, so we have three ah, versions of this. Distribution channels. See, okay. distribution channels, Great. that's that's it. And we're mm -hmm. thinking about, we're traveling, oh, I, w I was thinking and reflecting about how I could I tell a story about globalization today, because mm -hmm. it's so complex and what could be an access to, an entry yeah, to that. Yeah, call it a game, why, why is that? <laughs> Excuse me? You call it a global game, why is Yeah, that? global game, it was the idea of the producer, but yeah, it's, uh -huh. it is a global game. And sometimes. It, Nice game and sometimes a cruel game. And then, ah, uh, after okay. discussing a while, we thought we could. I, cu I thought I could take the smartphone or the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody has a global, mm -hmm. global, global oh. access to global this information. Is the is playground, if not yeah. a better brand. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <laughs> yes, you're right. And so we thought we could travel from the U.S. Uh, to well, the, this is made by over a thousand parts from over one hundred. 50 countries, so so I thought we could travel to some regions where mm. parts of this are, are oh, produced. Okay. So we're going to Congo, to Africa, and we're going to uh, to India, where so it is produced or assembled right now. Of mm. course, Taiwan with TSMC, mm. China where it is assembled, Europe where the consumers sit, and but mm. some parts of the apps are made there in India as well, nearly in every part of the world. And so we travel a little round down to Singapore and Malaysia, at least, to, to have a kind of okay. common thread. The entire supply and demand chain. Yeah, um, but it's more a net, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, and, and did you go on those cargo ships as well? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I get off the ship again. <laughs> Maybe it, takes, it will take three weeks or something. Yeah, and that's what the, the idea was to ask everywhere okay, rolling. what people think about globalization. And so what interests me here is, on one hand, uh, chip manufacturing, of course, as a part of, of uh, the iPhone and every smart or many smartphones. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, uh, yeah, the labor uh, uh, Taiwan as a labor of democracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, would, I was wondering of what you you mentioned it already in the other film, but what does what would globalization mean to you and? F uh, in terms of digitalization and democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the, the top leading now, <laughs> right? The democracy in terms of the freedom on the net uh, in all of Asia Pacific. Uh, recently, Freedom House published a report that placed Taiwan at the top of Asia Pacific. Um, obviously, we have advanced a lot uh, during the past few decades, and the most important thing is that we didn't do it alone, right? We work with many international partners, which is why in my ministry there's a department for democracy network, but there's no department for international cooperation. So for us, this is not about nation to nation only or bilateral or multilateral only, but about people to people relationship because on the internet, people who share the same value are very close, they're neighbors. Uh, it doesn't quite matter geopolitically whether they are located uh, in the same time zone or not. Uh, we can foster the same shared values together. I see. And uh, what does democracy mean in this terms, mm -hmm. in the uh, globalized and digitized era? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the idea is relevant publics, right? Nothing about us without us. So anything, any decisions, any systems that affects certain people, these people, even though that they, as you mentioned, is a very long net. So from the uh, impact side, sometimes it's difficult to trace all the way back uh, to all the causes. But we do see, for example, in traditional social media, a few people uh, in a certain city writing the algorithms can actually affect polarization degrees in another jurisdiction, like many, many thousands of miles removed. 
uh, but they, these people do not and did not, uh, currently still do not, have a say to how that algorithm uh, is written and how it is um, having an effect on their daily lives. So this kind of governance challenges is unique to the digital realm because in many other traditional realms, obviously anything that affects the society or environment and so on in a smaller district or town, um, you can probably trace back its pollution sources or uh, its sources of those actions uh, in a nearby city or at least a neighboring country. Uh, but now, with the digital, the cause and the effect is global and we need to work also globally to ensure that everybody gets affected by those AI's algorithm and so on, uh, has a say in the decision making. Mm. We've been talking to Billion Lee also about this. You maybe or probably know yeah, of the cofacts. Of the uh, cofacts, and some of those young people there, which uh, told us they they'd be very insecure mm -hmm. facing this fake news, uh, fake information, mm -hmm. algorithms, uh, mm -hmm. uh, both if they come from political political era, um, uh, space or from advertising or so on. It's yeah, trying to actually. It's scamming. also something all the democracies are facing together. Yeah, so it's both the consumer side and the political side mm -hmm. or where, where this appears and where it's make yeah. people feel insecure. Indeed. Uh, so recently, uh, the Taiwan government in the legislature has a law amendment that says um, in the wake of the generative AI that lets people uh, across many different uh, cultures to convincingly uh, scam people in any target culture, which again didn't used to exist, right? You have to understand the target culture instead of win the confidence and uh, play the calm game, right, against the target culture. Uh, but now with generative AI, anyone can calm anyone, regardless of the cultural differences. And this means that the bad actors are currently having an advantage uh, in synthesizing scams that uh, invites people to invest uh, in um, you know, stock, cryptocurrency, or things like that, but ultimately their, their money is gone, right? So the amendment that our legislature pushed uh, a couple of months ago was that if Facebook or other large platforms um, was noticed um, this kind of scams, uh, maybe by Kofax and other people who flag this, uh, and if Facebook doesn't take that down uh, in 24 hours, uh, and if it kept up, Facebook still earns advertisement money uh, of those scamming uh, sponsored ads, and somebody get conned $1 million, then now in Taiwan, Facebook is liable for that million dollars. So this is re-internalizing the bad externalities. And after that, Facebook put a lot more effort on civic integrity, and, and now is in a, uh, I think, pretty good relationship uh, with the enforcement of this new amendment. So the idea is that for uh, foreign interference on elections, for non-consensual intimate images, revenge porn, uh, and this kind of deep fake financial scams, these are the things that we're now re-internalizing to the platform, the external liabilities to them. Do you think this might work, uh, work worldwide? Mm -hmm. I remember some people complaining that in the Clinton era, mm -hmm. uh, when they first established uh, social mm -hmm. networks and uh, everything, the ground for this, mm -hmm. they, uh, one of the advisors from uh, Bill Clinton said they forgot about regulations because they thought it was, this would just be something for free speech, uh, the social networks, and this mm -hmm. was an error. So uh, today, a lot of companies, you mentioned Facebook, but there's some other global players who really make money out of data, uh, they feel like in the Wild West or somehow like that. Is there, is there what you, you mentioned, this amendment and the rules in, in Europe as well? Uh, should there be an effort uh, glo global, globally to, to push back mm -hmm. this kind of, yeah? No, definitely. Uh, I mean, not just uh, with like the EU as a unit, but we also worked with individual uh, EU member states uh, for example, uh, just this January, I visited Lithuania. I am now a Lithuanian e-citizen. <laughs> I have this uh, e-residency uh, card. Uh, and uh, I had a uh, long conversation with their Minister of Economy and Innovation, uh, Osrine Amarnete, uh, about not just um, you know, laser or satellite technology or cyber security, but also exactly as you said, about privacy enhancing technologies and data altruism, meaning that um, 
it should not be extractive where people, you know, you just send a message or post a photo to me and so on, but indirectly the platform uh, on top of which uh, many applications are built gets to train AI models in a way that is not transparent to either of us uh, and profit immensely from it, but without any of us even having the knowledge uh, of that, our photos and um, are already being trained in a way that we have no idea uh, about, right? So the alternative called data altruism organizations is a little bit like um, a coalition or a cooperative of data producers. So in Taiwan, for example, in many gyms uh, and uh, sports centers and so on, uh, they have participated in the data altruism project where individual people who go there to exercise uh, can voluntarily, um, and anytime they can opt out, but they can voluntarily donate their exercise data uh, so as to inform people maybe suffering from the health condition that are similar uh, to them, uh, or people who want to uh, achieve a certain result after a month or exercise or so, uh, but actually they didn't know that they should actually do some other training program because of their specific uh, body characteristics that works much better and so on. So this kind of AI models obviously benefits people who want to exercise, but if we do not have a not-for-profit uh, data operative in the middle, uh, there is also a perverse incentive to also benefit, not uh, from just you know uh, making people exercise better, uh, but actually selling them targeted advertisement or things like that, which will go contrary right, to the original altruistic um, motivation of donating my exercise data to uh, the benefit of people who have a similar maybe heart condition as me and so on. So um, this kind of data altruism organization rests on two principles. One is voluntary and at any time um, opting out and privacy enhancing technology that ensures that none of those raw personal data can uh, flow to the application side and so privacy is entirely preserved. I see, that's a good example. Uh, in general, how should uh, people uh, look at themselves mostly as consumers mm -hmm. and, uh, and the sense of bourgeois? And how, how, how can they become also citizens? This is the other side you are mentioning, by being active and mm -hmm. being uh, like looking at what is happening to my own data. Mm -hmm. So being citoyen uh, mm -hmm. in a certain way. So how can we build up those two sides of a personality mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think this is a great question. Um, I think the point is that we need to increase the bandwidth of democratic participation. If it's just a vote among, say, eight candidates and 16 parties uh, every four years, right? And that's just what seven bits, right? Three bits plus four bits, seven bits of upload every four years. Uh, which is very small bandwidth and very high latency, meaning that you have to wait uh, four years or two years, right? So even a, a referendum, uh, we have national referendum of at most maybe seven different propositions. That's again just seven bits, right? So uh, the existing democratic process um, is way too slow and way too limited for people to fully experience uh, a sense of participation. So in Taiwan, instead, we have what's called a continuous democratic process. Anyone can start a e-petition online after collecting 5,000 signatures. A minister or the minister's delegate goes to them and have a face-to-face -face conversation or a citizen's assembly and so on. There are citizens' uh, assemblies and panels around participatory budgeting as well. There is the presidential hackathon where people start new ideas that works in a local way, but we uh, bridge the public servants, the private sector, and the civil society together and scale those uh, local ideas nationally and so on. So at any given time, at any day, you have several places where you can contribute to make a real difference and for the government to respond in the here and now. And so the bandwidth is higher and also the latency is lower. You can see instant gratification after maybe just a week or a couple months. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. It's too short. Sure. No. Uh, Dress rehearsal. Thank you.
So maybe we have, we should we have to repeat only the uh, last two the, the last three last sentences. Okay, sure, sure, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a way of, uh, on the one hand, you have, you have deep fakes, and on the, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you're yeah. uh, delivering deep democracy somehow. Mm -hmm. well, how would you name that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, definitely. No, I, I think, so I'll repeat the last couple yeah. sentences. Uh, yeah, so um, I think one of the main advantage Taiwan has is that internet and democracy evolved together in Taiwan. So when the internet came and with personal computers, that's around early 90s and so on, our martial law was just lifted. And the first direct presidential hackathon, sorry, I'll do this again. The first, um, let's see. So I think the key here is that internet and democracy uh, co-evolved because they appear in a very similar time frame in Taiwan. Just as we lifted the martial law at the late 80s, personal computing and internet came along. And when we had our first direct presidential election in 1996, that was also the year for Wild Web uh, to be adopted and e-commerce and everything. So from the very beginning, uh, since 96, our imagination of democracy is not a limited bandwidth like uploading seven bits every four years, uh, a ticket of uh, eight candidates, uh, of uh, seven referenda propositions. No, it went far beyond that. It is more of a deep, continuous democracy that integrates the voice of the people through participatory budgeting, through um, the presidential hackathon that integrates the local innovators into the national teams with private sector, public sector, and the civil society, as well as real-time e-petitions that anyone collecting 5,000 signature can summon the minister or the participation officers of the relevant ministries to those people and have a citizen's assembly, a deliberation together. So what is the access point in uh, practically if people do that, mm -hmm. exercising democracy every day or yeah. hour? Do they take their smartphones and yes. just like to order a meal yeah. or something? They, no, exactly. Yeah, how, would you, how would you do that? To, uh, yes, yes. So basically, uh, just get your phone and you go to join.gov.tw and that's it. This is a one-stop shop. Uh, for participatory budgeting, uh, budget auditing, regulatory pre-announcements, deliberative polling, uh, and e-petitions, and many, many more. Ah, great. That's, mm -hmm. That sounds really good. You mm -hmm. had some good experiences by, by, during the pandemic because you deepened democracy. Mm -hmm. And Germany and other, many other European countries, we have now a polarization of the society, mm -hmm. and we had this during pandemics. How did you do that? Yeah, it's interesting, right? We didn't have a anti-vax political faction during the pandemic. Um, everybody got vaccinated, although there is a friendly competition. Uh, that's basically my vaccine is better than your vaccine. Uh, we had choices of uh, initially three and then four different vaccine types. Uh, there are people who believe that only the vaccine that they got was the, the right one and the other ones are, are not good. Uh, so I got uh, four different kind of vaccines just to make a point. Uh, and so uh, we did that through radical transparency. We published um, every day uh, the preferences of people in different age brackets and different uh, counties and cities and whether they prefer Moderna or AstraZeneca or BNT Pfizer or Medigen. And so, um, and so because of that, <clears throat> people who don't prefer a certain vaccine like AstraZeneca in a certain age group, they very quickly see that their younger um, compatriots uh, did prefer and did get vaccinated and nothing bad happens uh, and so on. So uh, it turns this vax, anti-vax polarization into a plural competition between the vaccine type preferences. And so this is the point. This is not avoiding conflict, but rather taking the conflict and through radical transparency and collaboration to turn this conflict into an energy for friendly collaboration and co-creation. Mm -hmm. 
it's been astonishing because I've been reading several interviews with you about this topic, and I always wonder because China blame uh, advertised itself as a very efficient mm -hmm. uh, mainland China as a very efficient society, mm -hmm. which uh, is more efficient than all those democracies, and the, you mm -hmm. proved the, the opposite. Uh, mm -hmm. it's how, what they in general say we are very efficient. They are mm. somehow, we've been visiting Shenzhen mm. and we've been looking at uh, Huawei, which mm. uh, they, they bring up those 5G mm. networks and everything, the smart cities, smart fabs, mm. smart traffic, smart uh, buildings, whatever, mm. and they say, oh, this is a new future of a very efficient society. Mm. But on the, on the other side, it's a control society mm. where we've got the cloud and every, you don't know what's going to happen with your data. And yeah. So mm -hmm. is this, uh, is this what do you think about this? Is this uh, un, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the only way we can go? Mm. To, if we, if we, if well, I, I mean, um, it's efficient only in the download speed, right? <laughs> so you can uh, get um, orders from the top uh, to the bottom very quickly, very efficiently. Uh, it's like having a uh, internet link that lets you very quickly download movies. But when you want to upload everything, um, or really just a short clip, uh, is that you cannot upload anything or it's very, very slow, right? So it's uh, efficient, but only in one direction, uh, which is the top-down direction. Uh, whereas democratic societies are better at the uplink, which is the bandwidth from the civil society, and especially from journalism, right? So people who spot something that's going wrong and so on um, in the ground, uh, they can very easily then broadcast the message that says, oh, there are new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market, uh, which uh, actually went to much more people in Taiwan uh, because of, uh, I think, around the turn of uh, 2020, the first day, actually, uh, that message went to the BBS, the bulletin board system in Taiwan, and it did catch attention. Whereas in Wuhan, I don't think it reached as many people <laughs> as it did uh, in Taiwan, right? So, so I mean, uh, the collective intelligence, the sensing abilities of the people and the journalist um, profession uh, was inhibited and indeed massively censored uh, during the pandemic, especially uh, within the BRC regime. Uh, whereas our counter-pandemic effort, just like in New Zealand, relies on people uh, directly reporting what's happening and thinking together what could be better measures to counter every variation, every mutation of the virus. Now, we, we don't uh, claim that we're uh, top of the world, uh, we're second to New Zealand, <laughs> but I think uh, it did help uh, in the three years to keep the uh, information ecosystem uh, free and also with integrity so people can learn the facts about the epidemiology together. Mm -hmm. So you would say the terms um, efficiency, maybe globalization, and democracy are linked together They because mm -hmm. they have to do something. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, and that, that's a really good point. Um, so instead of seeing uh, free expression, <coughs> I'll do this again. So indeed, instead of seeing uh, free expression and free association and so on as a power struggle, uh, we need to see it as a way for people to come to live together with something that we can all live with, to form a rough consensus across different cultures, across different nations, and so on. Because if you don't trust the freedom of expression and assembly and association, what you would do is to do lockdowns, essentially, right? Locking down the uh, virus of the mind, uh, the descent and so on, uh, through top-down, shutdown uh, ways. But then, in return, you don't get better ideas in terms of governance. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you judge this, but uh, my, uh, my view, we, have, we see many phenomena uh, from the consumer world, like. Uh, films from from the US like Netflix and so on going successfully or you mentioned Facebook Apple products like the smartphone these are products uh, which are really f successful globally mm -hmm. on the other side we have this kind of uh, political struggle mm -hmm. and renationalism this is kind of a paradox isn't it uh, how could we mm -hmm. get along smoother between mm -hmm. the nations as well because uh, in the age of geopolitics this is very conf much conflicting with each other. Mm -hmm. each other as a yeah, um, I think one of the key points uh, that people have observed 
is that the easy connection between people and people on global social media platforms doesn't mean that people are paying attention well. It means only that whatever you say to me, if it's on a public platform, uh, somebody else from a completely different culture can now easily find it and see it. But it doesn't mean that they will understand our context uh, in the same way. Uh, maybe they uh, misunderstand, maybe they misinterpret, maybe they took the same expression which means different things in their culture. Uh, and indeed on Facebook or Twitter, you see this like dunking, right? You would do a quote tweet uh, or you would do a share uh, and highlighting this one line in that tweet or in that Facebook post and say that, oh, this is completely ridiculous. This is something that I hate or things like that. So in a sense, it made outrage easier to spread than understanding uh, because for understanding, you need to uh, pay attention. You have to actually listen and see the entire context. But because the screens on these phones are small, it's difficult to comprehend the entire context. It's rather easier to just see a part of it. Unless, of course, you have a foldable uh, phone, <laughs> which <laughs> turns into a tablet. Uh, but anyway, so, so the point is that uh, with limited context and too easy to dunk, on something that you don't completely agree with, um, this platform actually collapses the context so that instead of mainly with an audience uh, that understand where we're coming from, it's mainly with an audience that didn't understand where we're coming from and have very limited attention to comprehend. And that fuels polarization, I would even say tribalism across nations. Really? Yes. And this is maybe because we... Entertainment is much more as very easy to to have on the smartphone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but having a deep understanding of another culture is quite more difficult. This is what you would say. Exactly, uh, and it's, it's much easier to fall into stereotypes. Like instead of laughing with another culture, laughing at another culture is much easier now. So the uh, I see the success of Netflix is something else than the while well, the struggle for of New York Times or any kind of Taiwanese. Uh, uh, information from journalists, uh, it's different type of information. It's mm. it, uh, much more difficult to understand, mm -hmm. I say, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned this aspect of AI. Uh, we were talking to E3 yesterday and today too we were talking to TSMC mm. and they mentioned that AI would be a much stronger game changer than smartphones, for example, mm. because uh, the man from Eatry said you could program in the very near future your own algorithms just by talking yeah. and giving some information to a robot or to any kind of device. Well, not the future. I've been doing this since this March. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I try that uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and this is, will change uh, very much because it's kind of self empowering the people. It's another mm -hmm. concept than the Chinese concept of controlling you mm -hmm. via mm -hmm. cloud and AI. I. Uh, mm -hmm. intelligence. So uh, what, what do you foresee? How will this change our, our daily life? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think um, this idea of uh, self-empowerment uh, is very important. In fact, this is at the core uh, of our work, uh, which is called uh, digital resilience for all, meaning that uh, anyone should be able to essentially fine-tune or train their assistive intelligence, much as I can adjust my own eyeglasses. <laughs> uh, right? It should work in the service of my dignity. Uh, it should be transparent. Well, the glass is pretty transparent uh, to help me see you better instead of pushing advertisement on my retina or things like that. Right? So it should work to enhance the dignity of not just individuals, but also communities with a shared value. Uh, and so, uh, and to do that, we advocate for the idea of public code, meaning that in our ministry, for example, we have the program uh, that uh, defended our website against uh, foreign attacks, cyber attacks, and so on. But instead of holding this proprietary, we just uh, released all the source code and data and material and so on to the public without copyright. 
so that anyone who wish to safeguard their website the same way or even taking advantage of the interplanetary file system that we uh, leverage can do so without our permission or even without our knowing about it. And so this kind of free dissemination uh, of empowering technologies to us means that we only want to ensure the communities have the means to um, have assistive um, help when it comes to AI instead of us or really anyone with a top-down control on the epistemic commons, meaning that how people perceive knowledge. It's only when anyone and everyone can tune these personal assistant models can we truly see a balance between the information manipulation on one side and uh, digital media competence uh, on the defense part. So, uh, but in the near future, we would just talk to the AI and say what well, mm -hmm. we want to have delivered as a kind of program or, mm -hmm. or service. Mm -hmm. as no, it, it's uh, as I mentioned, I've been doing yeah. this for a while, right? Yeah. So, um, ever since this March, where I got this laptop, uh, I've been running large language models uh, locally and fine tuning it. So, for example, my emails, uh, the draft of my email replies, the entire English text uh, is synthesized. Uh, by this fine-tuned model, which never leaves my laptop. It's trained on my laptop. So every night it can read my emails of that day and learn how I think about my emails that day and draft my replies tomorrow. Of course, I always read carefully before hitting send. <laughs> I'm not letting my email assistant take over uh, my reply, but because uh, the uh, AI serves only my interest, and it does it in a way that doesn't compromise the confidentiality and privacy. It is very empowering to me because then I wouldn't, um, you know, wake up one day and find out OpenAI or Microsoft just changed their algorithm and they no longer speak the way I think and so on. This is like personal computing. So uh, would big companies uh, try to do a, make a service out of it very soon? And do we know some regulations to, to mm -hmm. provide it? Yeah, indeed. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, our cabinet has already passed uh, the guidelines to the public sector in the use of generative AI. And in it, in addition to, of course, to ensure the like honesty and harmlessness, which are both research topics when it comes to generative AI, there are safeguards in place, and there's also cybersecurity uh, requirements. So, for example, if an AI model processes anything about personal data, in our cabinet uh, and all the public service, uh, it must be connected to the, um, only the data source, but disconnected from the internet. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it must never uh, even have the possibility of leaking those personal data to the internet. Only when it is contained uh, in a cybersecurity, what we call an enclave, uh, a closed uh, network, can it start processing personal data uh, with cybersecurity measurements. So, for example, on my laptop, I can switch to airplane mode, and I know it's not connected to the internet, and then I can run this AI model. That sounds very good. Uh -huh. So this is a kind of uh, measure or a kind of way to, to deepen trust between citizens and governments, mm -hmm. yes. and perhaps to do something against this polarization in society, mm -hmm. or what are your hopes to, uh, yeah, that yeah definitely. Project. Yeah, we're investing uh, in a lot of those uh, plural technologies. We define plurality as technologies in the service of collaboration across diversity. So no matter how much conflict there is, there are a certain kind of technology that always bring them together. So this is the opposite of polarization. <laughs> Instead of uh, polarized conversations, this is a plural conversation, for example, uh, that finds out the common values of progress and safety and participation when it comes to generative AI. We actually run uh, workshops uh, both online and face-to-face -face in Taipei and Tainan to find the shared values among people of very different ideological camps when it comes to AI. And using such plural technology like POLIS, we always highlighted the parts that people are actually agreeing with. Right? And so these are the bridging narratives. And we're also investing in technologies like Talk to the City that will just go through hours and hours of video and its transcript and so on and synthesize 
a avatar that will talk to you. It's like an executive summary that is a chatbot. Uh, and so you can ask, uh, there's a new situation. What does this original community think? So instead of one deliberative citizen assembly, this can live on, right, to deliberate uh, as a kind of proxy or avatar in future deliberations that bring even wider gaps together. And always it goes back to the exact uh, timestamp uh, in the video, so not representing or hal uh, hallucinating uh, <laughs> right, what, what the original people said, but always with a very clear synthesis of what their common demands are, what their voice uh, means semantically across language and cultural differences, and with the ability for two of those models or many to synthesize a bridge, so something that would speak to both of these original communities. That sounds really great. Mm -hmm. um, if we come from Europe and from Germany and look at Taiwan, it's a kind of really a, a astonishing example of a developing democracy. What could we learn from, from mm -hmm. Taiwan? Because it's so, such a unique uh, example here in Southeast East Asia. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think? Um, I, I, I won't uh, talk specifically about Germany because it's been a while since I uh, lived in Germany. Right. So um, I think uh, the main. Let's speak about yeah. Western democracies yeah, because so, we have the yeah, same, yeah. share the same problems more or less in the US and in, Europe. Indeed. And so. Yeah, I think in general, the newer democracies uh, like Taiwan or Estonia uh, that started uh, to practice democracy only after the personal computers, basically, uh, we have this view that the citizens uh, should have more symmetric input in relationship with governments and the private sector. In many other older republics and democracies, this is the first sector, this is the second sector, uh, public and private sector, and this is loosely speaking of the civil society. Right? But in Taiwan, uh, we have the public sector, we have the private sector, and we have the social sector. And so instead of seeing citizens as just grassroots organizations and so on, we have civic infrastructure that let people assemble together even more effectively than people do in the private sector through shareholders or through the board and through CEOs and so on, or in the public sector um, through voting and so on. So the people you have interviewed with, uh, the G0V or Gov0 uh, movement, like the COVAX and so on, um, are pioneers in that. So just as the public sector offers this one-stop shop for joining uh, decision-making and join the GOV, the TW, if you change an O to a zero, uh, you go to join that G0V, that TW, which is the social sector's <laughs> portal uh, for entering the Gap Zero Collective. And time and again, in terms of um, during the pandemic, visualizing where the masks are, in inventing contact tracing method that doesn't compromise privacy and so on, the social sector has proved that it's even more innovative than any of the private sector or public sector. And so we follow the people's lead in such uh, decisions when it comes to pandemic control and infodemic control and so on. So this is what we call a people-public-private partnership. Oh, that's great. I came to learn a lot today. Mm -hmm. so, if I, uh, so if I compare it with old Western uh, democracies, I'd say this is a kind of digital native democracy, mm -hmm. which has uh, mm -hmm. became a democracy via digitalization. Mm -hmm. And this would offer an example perhaps to other countries, maybe, mm -hmm. or what do you think, to yeah, other definitely. countries in Africa or wherever, in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. to, to, to follow the, the example or to copy paste some, some of the patterns. Or what, mm -hmm. what, what do you think of internationalization mm -hmm. uh, uh, of this kind of project you, mm -hmm. you just experienced here? Yeah, definitely. When I say symmetrical, I mean that this is not just about the citizens trusting the government. This is more about the government, the public sector, trusting the citizens. Uh, because to give no trust is to get no trust. So the civic infrastructure is about how to make it easier for the public sector to trust citizen input. And only when we have that can some of the citizens trust back.
<laughs> into a mutual trust relationship. Uh, in Mandarin, in Taiwan, um, I'm uh, the Minister of Shu Wei Bu, or the Ministry of Digital Affairs. But Shu Wei, digital, also means plural or several, right? More than one, right? So uh, I'm also a Minister of Plurality. <laughs> so uh, always we think in non binary terms, meaning that this is not just about the public versus the private. Uh, the uh, good versus the bad, um, the ideas of um, centralization versus decentralization. Instead, we see it as a uh, playground, not just a battleground, for those ideas to co-create and make something that's even better than the original polarized ideas. So the idea of plurality is quite core to my ministry, and you can find more in the book I'm writing at plurality.net. Oh, great, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Uh -huh. We are talking That's next week. Yes. Need to change the better do, do you have some for, uh, time for some more yeah, two sure, or sure, three sure. questions? Yeah, we, we have time for great. a few. Because uh, next week we're going to Singapore and oh, ask to okay. uh, talk with Parakana, uh -huh. maybe uh -huh. you know him. And he's, he uh -huh. wrote a book about migration and said this is one of the new global phenomena we are facing with. Uh, the ne within the next mm -hmm. decades, where we have mm -hmm. more and more migration. And you've been mm -hmm. talking about polarization. And today we experience in Germany, especially with uh, many people coming from Ukraine and other yes. well areas from the Near East, uh, uh, tensions with, my, to, uh, with migration so it polarizes society. On the one hand, there are people that say, well, economically and from points of humanity, we need that and we sh shall share our, our wealth. On the other hand, there are people who are anxious. So um, mm. I wonder, because you were talking about this binary approach, not to divide, mm. but reunite, and uh, uh, thinking in a plural pluralist concept, uh, what has this got to do with migration and all those kind of tolerances mm. we probably need within the next years? Mm. And also for global, not only for living together, but also for working together and mm. producing things together. Yeah, no, this is uh, a huge topic in Taiwan. Uh, during the martial law, we only had one national language, Taiwanese Mandarin. Uh, but in fact, uh, Taiwan originally composed before the 1940s uh, of people speaking Nihongo, speaking Daigi, speaking Hakka, speaking the 16 indigenous nations uh, in 42 different language variations. Uh, of course, today, we all of this, including sign language, are recognized as national languages. But we did have like four decades uh, of this binary thinking, like whether you're speaking the Guoyu or official language, or you're speaking a Fang Yan, which is a dialect, right? Uh, and the Fang Yan speakers were punished in schools and so on. So uh, we had our share of top-down authoritarian uh, control. Uh, that basically uh, wants to build uh, a new um, social contract, an identity uh, that is based only on one official ideology and nothing else, including other languages, right? And so uh, I think we've uh, grown past that um, now, uh, that through our transition um, to a full pluralistic democracy, but I would say that we've had a lot of experience in effecting this transitional justice uh, that uh, not only admit the wrong of just settling on one official ideology, but also actively work on reconciliation projects that bring those different cultures uh, together. And it did really help uh, for our democracy to take both sides or take all the sides as recent um, as our marriage equality, uh, which was determined by the constitutional courts, multiple referendums, and many uh, deliberative processes and the legislation, right? Uh, and so throughout all that, we found that actually both sides um, cared about family. It's just that some people uh, who care about family in a way that is more about preserving traditional values in kinship and 
heteronormative uh, kinship, basically. And there are people who care about the daily um, rights and duties, essentially, as two people wedding together. Uh, and so our final law is unlike any other nation. We basically said when two same-sex people wed, they wed as individuals, but their families don't. Uh, and so <laughs> this is, means that uh, it, there's uh, new uh, rights and duties uh, by law, uh, but there is no kinship in law. So there's no new brother-in-law, sister-in-law <laughs> that uh, were introduced when two people wed and they're of the same sex. Uh, of course, neither side are perfectly happy with it, but they all live with it. So there is now much more consensus now on this new way of marriage equality that legalizes the individual rights but not the kinship rights. Uh, and so this is one very concrete example in how very different cultures from very different traditions and even religions, uh, but through a plural perspective, can co-create something that everybody can live with. So, yeah, that's very interesting. Because in, in Germany there's a big discussion about uh, the language and how we to, uh, should speak and read our articles and newspapers, how our news should be mm. uh, 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 spoken. And is this, uh, should there be a, a gender neutral language or just a traditional kind mm. of language, German language? And I think, uh. me myself, I always think this is overestimated because uh. everyone should practice like uh. he or she wants to. Uh. So uh -huh. maybe it's a kind of a phenomenon yeah. of a social change process uh -huh. or something like that. Yeah. I don't uh -huh. know what uh -huh. you would think about that. No, my, my pronouns is whatever, right? So you can address me uh, as Miss, as Mr. Uh, I, I don't care, right? You can address me as the right honorable if you want. <laughs> the point that I'm making, <laughs> the point I'm making um, is that um, it speaks exactly as you said, about uh, the inclusivity uh, of the environment instead of about forcing everyone to use one same um, set of pronouns. Uh, so there are people, actually, uh, there were a journalist writing in Hebrew uh, in Israel, which it's impossible to have a gender neutral verb even, right? So the, the grammar was just not there, right? Uh, so he alternated between the masculine and feminine for every <laughs> verb uh, describing me. <laughs> and so that's also very creative, right? So, so, and so the, the point is that now with language models, with AI, it's very easy to normalize to the listener's uh, perception, right? So if you prefer a certain way of using the language, you can just tell your assistive intelligence and it will translate all the things you see. Uh, it's like wearing an eyeglass um, from any website, from any app, and so on, into that particular preference of yours. And you would be uh, still conversing uh, actively right, in the public. And so I think a lot of those um, orthography um, fights and so on was only because there was no um, reliable, trustworthy, and personal, as in I can tune in myself, ways of deploying AI like eyeglasses do. And once uh, we all have this kind of assistive intelligence, I don't think this will be a problem anymore. So this will be a very, very new future, you think? Mm -hmm. So all those assistants or chatbots would, which mm -hmm. would help me could be around for, yeah, you always uh, already mm -hmm. use that, but uh, how was it uh, generally in, tai in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. How many people uh, behave like you and, mm -hmm. and have this access and intelligence also? Mm -hmm. May I, you know, honorable, mm -hmm. may, I, <laughs> may I say so? Excellency. <laughs> Excellency, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, truth to be told, I think our primary schoolers and uh, high school students, they are the generation that see this um, as a boon, not a ban because we changed our curriculum. Uh, back in uh, 2019, we rolled out a new curriculum that I was part of the committee before joining the cabinet that switched all the word literacy, which is about understanding some common framework, uh, to competence, which is the ability for you to produce into the information commons to add your own perspective, to be like a journalist, uh, essentially. Uh, and so all the rote memorization, standardized answers, and so on, implied by the literacy um, paradigm, um, 
you know, they can safely just use uh, not even AI, just search engines right, for that. Uh, there's, there's really no need for a human to compete uh, memorization with computers. Right? Uh, but then uh, what's human is the ability to autonomously interact with other humans, maybe with very different cultures, to work a common good goal. And these competencies became the core of our curriculum. So unlike in many other jurisdictions that were still using the literacy uh, framework, we did not um, fear the generative AI. Uh, when ChatGPT uh, appeared, I don't think there's any high school or primary school that banned the use uh, of such chatbots. Of course, they you know, hallucinate wildly. There's a lot of non-helpful ways of using that and so on, but we see that as part of the competence uh, in how people can actually uh, participate and align those AIs to the community needs. So we never take a, oh, this is cheating, so let's ban that uh, attitude towards such new technologies. So there's this kind of competency of humans which uh, could, uh, yeah, we could uh, see globally or could mm -hmm. uh, could have globally uh, in, in terms of uh, planetary solidi solidarity somehow. Yes. Yes, uh, well, for this decade, uh, for next maybe interplanetary uh, solidarity, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the usage of your smartphone. Uh -huh. You still use one, not only yes. AI. I see. Uh -huh. How, what do you do with it, if, if I may ask? Oh, yeah, so, so I never touch the screen. Uh, I always do it through the stylus. So uh, first, I always prefer uh, this uh, full screen uh, because it affords a larger context it's easier to be balanced when you have a larger screen. And then I never touch it. I always interact through a stylus because when I interact with the stylus, it's intentional. So I think about what I will click and I click it. I think about whether I will swipe and I swipe it. But if it's my finger, it's too intimate. So after a while, uh, it's the phone swiping me, right? I would feel this urge uh, to continuously swipe, and I couldn't put the phone down uh, after I used the touch screen for more than an hour or so. I don't think this is just me, I think this is everyone. So um, by intentionally using the keyboard or mouse or stylus, an intermediate device, I don't think the phone is part of my body, and therefore I can put it down anytime. I actually went into many meetings and many uh, tours and so on without even bringing my phone because I'm truly not addicted uh, to it. Uh, and so only when we're not addicted to it, do it become an uh, assistive tool of us. Otherwise, they're actually our monsters and we are the tools. I see, it's like a drug. Yeah, uh -huh. I see, yes. that's very interesting. If we summarize a little, it's hard for me to follow you because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, your excellency of I and mean, your brightness is really astonishing mm -hmm. by explaining all these things to me. But summarizing, what are the major challenges uh, if you look from Taiwan to the world? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the major challenges globally we're facing now? We mm -hmm. didn't mention sustainability, for example, mm -hmm. but authoritarian regimes mm -hmm. are rising and so on, and yeah. digit digital tools are used in a bad way in many countries, mm -hmm. China, uh, China and other. other uh, countries uh, and mm -hmm. companies sell a lot of those uh, surveillance technologies yeah. and so on. But where do you see mm -hmm. personally the major challenges? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think the main challenge is that overall in Western democracies, many people still buy this idea that democracy only leads to chaos, hate, and polarization. This is the. We're good? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I'll sorry. do this again. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's fine. So, um, during the pandemic, in the first year, in 2020 especially, there was this narrative from authoritarian regimes that says only authoritarian ways can control the virus and democracy only leads to chaos. Um, I think even after this is shown to be not true, still there are many in Western democracies that actually did believe and still do believe that democracy only leads to polarization and hate. But this is a self-defeating mentality. This leads then to the state government, um, you know, enforcing censorship or takedowns or limitations to internet rights and so on in the name of fighting against disinformation, for example. 
and that actually fuels conspiracy theories, which is a vicious cycle uh, that made it harder and harder to defend information integrity online. But the Taiwan model is essentially we only counter the chaos or polarization by deepening democracy. So more democracy, not less democracy, is the way to counter against these new threats. And the challenge globally is currently not a majority of the world think this way, <laughs> and which is why we need um, documentary filmmakers uh, and anyone who can tell a story to share this new story far and wide. Thank you so much. So mm -hmm. for you, there's a big difference between anarchy mm -hmm. and chaos, mm -hmm. which ma 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 uh, yeah, some indeed. people yeah, indeed. identify yeah, falsely. I, I, yeah, indeed, I, I'm a Taoist, right? But not in the religion sense, <laughs> but rather uh, in that I believe uh, in natural action, meaning that instead of anyone coercing anyone else, there should always be ways for voluntary association for us to come to terms together. And this is essentially a philosophically Taoist thinking. And so in Taoism, anarchism doesn't mean chaos and violence and throwing bombs or things like that. But rather, in a Taoist mentality, anarchism means that people have come to find the way, uh, the Tao, uh, which is about uh, the road that brings people together, uh, meet in the middle, instead of the cliff uh, which you know leads somewhere else right uh, and so this kind of streams this kind of doubt this kind of the way doesn't prescribe a central ruler of any kind but again this is not about chaotic violence thank you so much thank this you. was really really uh -huh. appreciated uh -huh. really good thank, thank you. you thanks so much awesome and now we film me walking out of that door or maybe, yeah. <laughs> whatever you like. Have so, a conversation so, with my colleague. Yes, uh, uh, we right. just want to have some B-roll. I would like That's to B-roll just to yeah. introduce you okay. and uh, tell them uh, some, uh, yeah, some, something about you and the project. So okay. we have more time to cut the interview and uh, 